I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you from Colorado, the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains and Dragon House Studios. This week we've got a real treat for you. We're going to spend some time with two exceptional people in the firearms industry. First, it will be Mike Bush. Mike has been around a long time. He's had a lot of really fascinating businesses. Most recently you know him because he is the creator of Voodoo Gunworks, the 22 bolt action rifle that essentially changed the entire shooting game and rocketed 22 precision into the stratosphere. After Mike, Frank Galley, another guy you're gonna recognize. But first, let's talk about Voodoo. Okay kids, today we're out here on the wilds of Eastern Colorado with Mike Bush from Voodoo Gunworks. As you know, the Voodoo 22 bolt gun has changed the game in, term, in terms of long range 22 shooting. Mike, you did the design work on this gun. What were the parameters you were looking for when you began putting this together? The, the first thing that uh, was on the, the objectives and requirements is that it had to be a true to scale platform, meaning that it is the same physical size and weight of the centerfire rifles that guys were shooting. Now that's an important point because PRS, those kind of long range competitions, has generated a large pool, maybe the greatest pool of American marksmen that has ever existed. Right. And they want things their way and you gave them a 22. Yes, and, and the, the cool thing about giving it to them their way, I mean first it had to start with listening to what it is they were asking for. And the ability to give that to them meant that they could take either our barreled action and drop it into any Remington 700 compatible stock or chassis and use any Remington 700 compatible trigger to put in the barreled action. Talk a little bit about this bolt because I know there's a patent, process, a patent on this bolt. Talk about how you chose to go the direction you went in. So this is a uh, this is a mid-lock bolt, meaning that the lugs are in the middle of the bolt, and lockup occurs obviously at the middle. Most 22s lock up at the rear using the handle as a bolt lug, or there may be uh, an opposing lug to the handle, and they could have two lugs or three lugs, but always in the rear. It's uh, it's simpler to manufacture. It's more economical to manufacture. And it's very common in those smaller scale platforms. Well, that's not what the guys were looking for. So in order to take a mid-lock design, uh, this is the first action to never have, first production action, I should say, to never have uh, lugways. The lugways are what the bolt, mm -hmm. the bolt lugs travel through, uh, protruding all the way through or propagating all the way through the receiver because it costs you consistency, shot to shot consistency. So I did away with the need to have those lugways, and with that came an issued patent, uh, and we have another pending patent uh, on a different approach to that. When you came into this project, you understood that basically 22s are something that, that we all shot when we were kids. We all accepted that they were what they were, which is 25 yard minute of squirrel. And you said, now, how do we go about making a gun that will shoot consistently 300, 400, 500, and I think we were talking earlier, and we'll be talking to Frank Galley a little later, on a thousand yards. Yes. What does that mean that you had to do with this rifle? You had to control all the variables, and what that means is absolutely everything from muzzle to butt uh, had to be predictable, and the only way to make it predictable was to, to design that level of predictability into the platform and even basically tell people what's going to work best in your rifle. So the chamber is designed around a specific ammo as well. Talk about the barrel a little. We, we've always talked about the barrel in a lot of ways as the heart of a rifle. Yes. Was this a trial for you when you were putting this together? It wasn't necessarily a trial, but I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because <laughs> I had a lot of people tell me that I could never make a cut rifled barrel work on a 22 uh, to any level of consistency. So almost out of spite, I pursued it uh, and, and we basically, you know, bought all the production capacity of a particular barrel manufacturer and laid in the ability for them to make rimfire barrels, and that's all they make now are our barrels, and they're all cut rifled. That's great, because I've heard the same thing. It doesn't work with a 22. Right. Well, you're wrong, by the way. 
Talk a little bit about weight. This is a heavy gun. Again, most of our viewers are coming out of a 22 speed competition where you don't want weight, you want light. That's, that's correct. So rifle setup is very subjective, uh, you know, but generally speaking, uh, what's going to work best for, for these two shooting disciplines, that being the NRL 22 or the Rimfire uh, PRS, uh, you need more weight to create stability based on the positions that you're shooting in. And although this rifle basically is at the pinnacle of how rifles could be set up, uh, we have a stock from Manners Composite Stocks, we have a zero compromise uh, optic on here. These are not low dollar components, but it's my rifle, so I got to build it the way I wanted. So, but as it relates to, you know, people just starting out, you don't have to go this way. But as long as you set your rifle up in a way that is conducive to the style of shooting you're going to do, then that's the place to start. What's the attraction of 22 long range compared to a lot of the other shooting that you've done in your life, which is a lot? The challenge is the attraction. And, and I, I think that's what has bode well for a lot of the people that's gotten into it is uh, there was a period, I think, that some of the centerfire stuff, uh, based on a limited number of ranges that would accommodate it, uh, it, it moved people in a different direction because they either had to travel too much or, you know, there was some limiting factor that kept that from working well for everyone. But with the rimfire, uh, you know, there's a lot of ranges that support an RL-22 and Rimfire PRS. So the availability of facilities was a lot greater. The challenge was the attraction to make it work as well as it does. Super. Well, I think you've done a great job. I love it when a small company comes in and, and, and disrupts an entire industry, changes everything to where You've managed in your 2009, 2007, when did you start? So I started on a project that led to this in 2009. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd known Frank uh, even a little bit before that. And originally, uh, this, what is right here in front of us was supposed to be the, the newly introduced Remington 40X Rimfire. Uh, but things in the world happen the way they do, and there's always a good reason for it. So ultimately what happened is we wrapped Voodoo Gunworks around what was a, a very uh, detailed, very deeply oriented uh, technical data package, and we built a company around what has become uh, you know, one of the hottest things in the gun industry right now. And Voodoo has become a synonym for the best of the breed. So thank you, as always. Thanks for coming out here. It's always great any excuse to hang around with Frank Gallup. Absolutely. Thanks, Absolutely. Mike. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating information. Thank you, Mike. When we come back, Frank Galley. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. It's true, you can't avoid the struggle. It's coming, but you can control your precision. It's time to put it all on the line because with Crimson Trace Optics, failure is not an option. Welcome back to Triggered. If you've watched Shooting Gallery a lot of years, you've met Frank Galley before. He, of course, founded the Sniper's Hide website, which is still going strong and has become one of the central clearinghouses for information on long-range precision shooting, of which Frank Galley is a master. In fact, his first book on long-range precision is coming out. We're going to be talking about that a little down the line. So let's head out to Fort Morgan, Colorado, where you can spit and hit Nebraska and Frank Galley. If I remember correctly, the very first time we had Frank Galley on Shooting Gallery many years ago, actually, we we're just getting out of flintlocks, we were talking about the rise of sniper culture. Yep. Uh, Stephen Hunter joined us, of course, A Point of Impact, all those great books. And Frank founded Sniper's Hide when? How long ago? 2000 is when it officially started. How it is today is about 2001. So we're about 20 years in. So that's a long, long time. time long, being on the internet. In internet years, that's roughly a million. Yes, close you know, something to I'm like at least that. a million in internet years. So you, you have uh, essentially dedicated your life to long range shooting, to long precision shooting. Yes. And, and now you've, you've moved into the 22 world. You're taking the lessons that you've learned there into this part of the sport. I'm, Talk about that transition. I'm going backwards. To, <laughs> so I got older, went to a point, now I'm going to go backwards. But yeah, um, honestly, for people our age, it's so much nicer. 
um, to go out there and to shoot like this. It's still fast, it's still dynamic, it still gets us in there, but we don't have to, um, you know, run and gun as hard. And with the, with the bigger guns, the 25 pounders and, and that, and, and yeah, we gotta compete against kids, but that's the fun part of it because you can mentor and you can bring them up. I've, I've shot um, several matches recently with juniors, 12, 13 years old. So it, it's just, it's so much fun. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a way of extending ourselves by bringing ourselves in closer. You know, we're shooting less distance, but we're acting like we're shooting farther. So the 22 just opens up so many windows. Talk a little bit about how at 25 yards, a 65 Creedmoor, that would be X, 100 yards. Or talk about how that scales. The scale. So 22 scale pretty well to our center fires. Uh, it's, there's actually scale data you can download from Finn Accuracy out there. Uh, guys from Finland who do this as well. And it's a 25%. So if we're at 100 yards with our center fire, we're at 25 yards with our rim fire. If we're at the 1,000 yards with our center fire, we're at 200 yards with our rim fire. And so the, the 100 yards is like a 500 yard deal, the, uh, about four and change. Um, the uh, 100 or 200 yard is exactly the same dope as my 6.5 Creedmoor on this range. So 7.4, 7.4. So I can get the same thing. And today we're using two mils of wind. Right. If I get on my 6.5 Creed, I'm going to be about a mil and a half, depending what bullet I use. It's very similar. So the training aspect is big, but then just the general shooting side of it is identical. Other than, you know, you have to put all of you into it because the 22 is unforgiving. So you have to make sure you're managing so much more because we're not depending on the speed and the weight, weight of the rifle, speed of the bullet to take up some of our deficiencies, we, we can't hide from the 22. And that's a very important point because people are going to say, well, boy, it must be a lot harder to shoot, oh, fill in the blank, a 300 PRC, you know, a 338 Lapua. Mm -hmm. It's not. You have certain latitude with those bigger calibers that just simply does not exist with 22 long rifle. The, 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 the hard part is putting together a group for people because that heavy recoil knocks them out of position. The 22, it's sometimes easier to put the group together because no recoil and it's staying there, but you have to be much more conscious of your fundamentals, much more conscious of the dwell time of the bullet in the barrel and understand just how long you can stay in position and how fast you can get out of it without messing that current shot up. A critical point for people coming into this is the match ammunition that we might shoot in these competitions is all subsonic. Mm -hmm. And that's because what we don't want is the bullet going supersonic and coming out of supersonic. Right. Talk about why that's important. The, the transition from supersonic to subsonic, we have that transonic range. And as that bullet is going through those transitions in the air and through speed, the back end of the bullet wants to pass the front end. It's a boat on step. If I got the boat going forward and I'm up on step and I'm going across the lake, I cut the motor, the back end of the wake is going to eventually hit the back of the boat and the boat's going to get squirrely. Same thing with your bullet. Some bullets not so squirrely, some bullets more squirrely than others. So with the 22, we throw it like a softball and we're floating it out there and it's staying consistent all the way. We're not having some transition in the middle that a specific bullet has to combat because these bullets won't combat that very well. <laughs> they do are little, like little concrete blocks yeah, flying exactly. into the wind. We're throwing bricks down range and we don't want the back of the brick to pass the front. <laughs> so um, we want to make sure if we keep the brick going a certain way, it stays that way the entire time. Now there are competitions like NRL 22 and Precision Rifle Series, but now people are looking at ultra long range, extra long distance shooting of 22s. Where's the limit? We talked about that at dinner last night. Where does that end it, up there? There isn't a limit yet. It's probably going to end up in the, it's going to be past a thousand for sure with the solids because solids, you could push them harder and they, sh and they should walk a little bit better. Um, we'll see where they go with the solids. But uh, where is the limit? The, the limit is in the rules. You, it's, it's basically stone cold show up three for three. End of story. If you can't get that first hit, second and third, it don't count. So that's where the, 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 the limiting factor is going to be. But how far we're going to push it is really going to come down to the scopes in the rifle and the barrels and what they're going to do here to get us the elevation we need 
Uh, 300 yards is 14 mils. This scope only has 26 in it, which is why they have prisms. Um, Night Force has right. the, the prism. Very much, yeah. Charlie Cat TACCOM unit has right. the prism. That's for 22s and stuff, the small prisms, not the big ones. Um, thread it on the front of your Night Force and you're adding elevation. There is no limit as long as we can keep adding elevation to our optic. That doesn't throw us in a way where we're doing that, where this, this, the scope is pointing at the ground and the barrel is pointing in the air. That's the limitation. We've got lots more with Frank Galley when Triggered returns. This week's Triggered is brought to you by Franklin Armory, the home of innovation in firearms. Volkortsen, engineering the world's best rim fires. Taurus, USA, designed to protect. Lipsies and their great guns of the month. And Revolution Targets, 21st century steel. What's been the effect of Voodoo Gunworks on this sport? What has the introduction of a high-end bolt gun done for the sport? Yeah, voodoo has set the tone, and Voodoo has become its own subgroup of Precision 22. When people talk, they're mostly talking Voodoo. So you'll say, when anyone's talking Precision 22, they mean to say Voodoo. Now, whether or not they have a Voodoo is a question. But they, these guys set the standard. These guys showed people what's capable in this platform, how you can build it out and make it like our centerfire rifles, and then just bring us to the next level. I mean, working with Mike and those guys, um, as they say a lot, they listen. And they didn't dictate to us. We said, we want this. And why do you want this? Well, originally, I want this to save ammo and train and practice for that. But then you start getting into it and go, well, whoa, this is way more fun than kind of doing that. And I can do it on a weekend in a 100-yard bay somewhere and sleep in my own bed. So the initial outlay is, is expensive. But then once you're going into that, we go through this stuff pretty easy. You know, I'm not spending $30, $40 right. a box or right. trying to reload it to, a, you know, an SD of two. I buy this, get it tuned up, and I can go an entire season. And so it's, it's non-stop because we're just going to shoot them and shoot them and shoot them and shoot them until they're done and then we're going to keep shooting them. Of course, this is your rifle, your Thunder Beast Suppressor, but what's cool is only you would go out and find an EOTech Voodoo scope to put in a Voodoo rifle. So this is a Voodoo Squared? <laughs> a Voodoo Squared, a Voodoo on a Voodoo. I, and I did that on purpose. Um, there's other scopes I, I would have went, went on here. But uh, yes, a voodoo on a voodoo I thought was, was a good play, and, and I loved it. And, and I honestly, it's a great scope, works really well. The reticle is where I want it. I like a, less of a reticle. They have a very nice holdover simplistic reticle with a floating dot. Um, treats me well. Toolist design, the, the voodoo works. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to see all of this on Shooting Gallery, Q1, Q2 of 2021. But you know... This brings us back to the shooting gallery, doesn't it? Yes, it does. We're right back into the, you know, Coney Island shooting gallery. Here we are. We're going to knock down some, some uh, ducks, clay pigeons, whatever. It's just plain fun. And, you know, we just recently did a reunion shoot for my students. I have over 500 students in just Alaska. And we did a reunion shoot. A whole half of them just showed up with their voodoos ah. and stayed over there and shot voodoos. And the other half shot a thousand yards. Guess who giggled the entire time? The voodoo people. <laughs> you know, the guys shooting a thousand yards are, oh man, uh, what, what? And even when you miss with a 22 at 300 yards, it's the funniest thing you've ever done. And so it, it just it just lends to entertainment. As always, that's great, Frank. Just to tell people, you're teaching classes out here in Eastern Colorado, actually classes around the country. Yep. How did they find you? Um, Sniper's Hide is the easiest way. Um, you also can get my book on Amazon um, for people who can't Let's make Let's mention the that. That's the... Yeah, uh, pr uh, Practical Precision Marksmanship. Uh, just look up Frank Galley on Amazon and, and you can grab that. Or Gun Digest's site has it. Um, so the, the books, the classes, the, the Sniper's Hide website, um, we are, you know, coast to coast with teaching our classes starting in February in California. We'll end around September, Pennsylvania and the East Coast, and then we're monthly here in Colorado. Excellent. So always doing that. As always, great to see you. Yes, awesome time. Loved and it. No matter what you read about Frank, <laughs> it's not true. Some of it is. <laughs> Spending time with Frank
automatically makes you a better shooter. Just the information that Frank spins off, like, oh, by the way, what about, oh, by the way, about this. It's just brilliant. If you get a chance, you can take a class from Frank here in the Denver area. He also travels literally around the world teaching classes. And you need to buy this book. Precision Rifle Marksmanship, The Fundamentals of Marine Sniper's Guide to Long Range Shooting. This must be in your library. So thank you very much, Mr. Galley. Thank you very much, Mr. Bush. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Bain. This is Triggered. Find us on michaelbain.tv. Find us on YouTube. Find us on everest.com. We'll have lots more gun stuff next week.